Hi, my name is Josef Schinwald. I'm a professor for game design and animation at the multimedia program uh, within the creative technologies department at the University of Applied Sciences in Salzburg, Austria. Um, I also have the honor of being head of animation there and therefore responsible for developing new curricula. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Epic Games and Thomas Misura from Reality Capture for inviting me here to give a presentation about what we think is uh, a new approach, at least for us, towards uh, master's education and how we got there, what hurdles we faced, uh, and how we sort of overcome them. Quick self-introduction. As you probably pr pretty much aware right now, I'm not a native speaker. Uh, because I'm from Austria, not Australia, common misconception still. Uh, lots more schnitzel than kangaroos in Austria. Uh, our two most famous exports are probably that guy, uh, you know, for, as governor of California, and for his movie quotes. Um, and that guy who's uh, most famously known for his chocolate balls and his music and his Mozart. So, I'm a little bit of a dinosaur when it comes to the industry. I've started 25 years ago at a small CG shop in Austria, probably the only one that there was at that point. Um, we used silicon graphics machines. I still have a soft spot in my heart for silicon graphics. Uh, and funny enough, we used side effects prisms, the predecessor to Houdini, which was an odd thing uh, in a small country like Austria, the only shop. Everyone was using like Max and 3D Studio 4, basically, back then. But um, I was lucky enough that the head of the company was sort of a visionary, and he wanted this sort of master-apprentice relationship with someone. So I got to sort of learn the craft from someone who was an early adopter, and he had been in animation for a decade by then, which was unheard of, at least in Austria at that point. Um, other than that, uh, I love watching Pixar movies with my son, who's inexplicably looks like Spot from uh, The Good Dinosaur. Uh, that is a few years ago, he looks different now. Um, and playing Fortnite with my daughter and my son. And I promise you I'm not paid to do so just because it's Unreal Fest. We really love Fortnite uh, and playing together. And looking at the character screen uh, from Fortnite when we play together says a lot about our family. First thing, my wife couldn't be made to play video games if her life depended on it, on it so she's missing. Then my son's into Teen Titans. Uh, he loves Beast Boy. My girl's 14. She's pretty much about looking cool and uh, being stylish. And I'm hopelessly nostalgic for my competitive Street Fighter days on the SNES. Uh, the thing we can agree on is that we have to color coordinate to be a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. And we sort of keep true to that one. Um, Besides that, uh, I love role-playing, uh, I love everything that has an engine, and I have a cat who really hates doing homework. <laughs> My university is rather young. Uh, in uh, German, it's called Fachhochschule. It's a special version of universities called Universities of uh, Applied Sciences. And uh, the difference is we're pretty much, uh, our mission is to be job enablers, above all. Um, and 30 years ago, when the uh, university was uh, funded and founded, uh, there was no animation program. And they wanted to have one or two classes in there. Uh, and they asked me if I could do that. And I said, well, why don't we go the step further and develop an animation education? And there was no industry where those students that came out of that education would go to within Austria at that point. So I basically told them, well, we need to build that industry. And we need to start somewhere. If there is no one that knows the craft of animation uh, and the art of animation, who should be the starting point for that industry? And I'd like to think that we sort of did help uh, build that industry by uh, doing it for almost 25 years now and having that animation education. So that's a, how does building a curriculum work? Basically, especially with, uh, I think, European, or at least Central European uh, Universities of Applied Sciences, it's a lot about, about demands, demands from the industry. So what is the local industry looking for in our alumni? Uh, 
uh, what is the current situation in the industry, what specialized skills uh, would you want from uh, alumni, and where is the industry heading to, and so on. And that is how it basically, the, that's basically the starting point for a lot of curricula and a lot of offerings when it comes to educational programs. And following that idea of latching on to trends is something that's far worse than our students. Uh, because they really think, okay, there is this trend, there is character animation is becoming big, so I need to be a character animator. I need to be a concept artist. That renderer is more, is more common now, so I need to learn that renderer and I become a lighting artist. And in sort of switching between those trends, they become in a way aimless in their education. And when we uh, build a curriculum for animation, I tend to go another way. And that stems from a, a situation I have every year, usually in, in, in May. We're sitting in front of applicants. And uh, those applicants are very shy, and they're like, okay, uh, I want to uh, study animation. I said, where do you want to go? What is the, if you're out there five years after you finished your education, where do you want to be? And they're very shy and very coy about it. But after a few minutes of poking them, they sort of come up and okay, I want to work at Pixar. I want to work at CD Projekt Red. I want to work on the next Final Fantasy. And that is our prime directive, if you want, our mission statement. That is what we want to do for our students and why we're there. And the question we ask ourselves is how can we support those young adults in becoming the artists they want to be? At the companies they admire, uh, working on the projects they're proud of. And going from there, we sort of formulated a mission statement. And full disclosure, whoever saw Adam Boy's presentation on uh, Tuesday, I sort of lent a little bit of his, uh, his slide about the vision of Dave Lang and why he, what he, what's his purpose in, uh, in building Iron Gal Galaxy. And our mission statement is create an amazing education to bridge the dreams of applicants with uh, the industry of tomorrow. So what does that mean? That means, first of all, we're giving them a promise, a promise of quality. So what we're trying to do is not stop short of really trying everything to get them the best possible education, the best possible lecturers, the best possible tools, and therefore uh, empathizing with their dreams they're presenting to us. So empathy and purpose is the second building part to us. We, we really take the dreams of our uh, applicants and then students seriously. And we really want to get them there. And it gives us purpose as an, educational uh, uh, as, a, as an educational institution as well, and the lecturers at that educational institution. And the final part has become more of a problem during the COVID pandemic, and that is security. Uh, students have become, uh, become very insecure uh, during the COVID pandemic on a personal level, but also on a professional level. Um, they are not sure of themselves, about the world out there, and about the industry out there. And we're sort of giving them the security that you'll be fine. The education you, you're going uh, through will prepare you for what, what's out there, and it will prepare you for getting the jobs you dreamt of. So what we want is getting our students from this to this. And to understand why, how we changed our paradigm or our approach towards designing an education that's providing that to our students, we have to take a quick look at our bachelor's degree before we go into the master's. A quick disclaimer beforehand, uh, we're talking about an artistic education. So um, there are some things that come with the territory. You need to know about art history. You need to know about the world around you, about liberal arts. What, what uh, society are you working for and are you working in? That's all part of a high quality arts education, and that's a given. I'm just not, not going to talk about that in this talk. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the curriculum instead of that background we have, we're giving every student. So our bachelor's in animation. That's a quick overview of what classes are there. 
there is 3D introduction, 3D animation, which is basically Maya 101. And we've been working with, with Maya for, uh, yeah, 20 years now, and we're very happy to do so. Autodesk has been a great partner. Maya has been a fundamental tool in the industry, and our students uh, have been very successful in using it. Um, then there's animation fundamentals, all the basic stuff from uh, Illusion of Life to Animated Survival Kit. Uh, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, there's animation production, going from production planning to budgeting, uh, all that part of uh, a project. Then there's a character track that leads them from concept art to modeling to uh, rigging, finally to animation. And there's dynamics, interactive authoring, there's rendering, composition, VFX. So our students get sort of a, a peak or a, a, a get a detail of every potential major specialization there is in the industry right now. But it's up to them to pick and choose. So when, when it comes to their final project uh, in, at the end of their bachelor study program, they they're going to choose, I'm going to be the particle dude. I'm going to be uh, the guy who's doing the environmental, mo environmental modeling, and so on and so on. So, and that works rather fine. It makes it structured. It makes our students knowledgeable in the tools. Uh, and it prepares them for an industry that demands specialization. And that works for what the output of a bachelor's program is, junior level artists. The industry expects of them that they are uh, specialized in one area. So when we looked at the masters and when it came time to design a master's program, we thought, well, we'll just do the same. That worked out well. Uh, why not do the same thing over and over again? And it didn't work at all. And that was kind of frustrating. And why didn't it work? Because if we look at that one, at that curriculum, we saw, OK, there's acting for animators. There's a character master level workshop, but it's only one semester. Then there's uh, advanced rendering, but it only deals with offline rendering. Then there's advanced visual effects, but that's only a compositing class, basically. And so on and so on. And there is advanced scripting, but it wasn't enough to bring them up to speed as a technical artist. And finally, there is project management, but not enough to make them producers. So what worked at the bachelor's degree sort of failed uh, to push our students further at the master's level. And did it always fail? Obviously not. Sometimes it worked beautifully, but the funny thing, in big air quotes, is it worked when the students were ignoring the curriculum. And they sort of said, to hell with that. I'm going to go in my team. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to ignore what the, all the classes are about. And mostly, they were going into game teams with our sister program, Multimedia Technology. And then, suddenly, magic could happen. Uh, but for someone who's responsible for designing the curriculum, that was really frustrating. Not because the students, that was great that the students overcame that problems, but it was frustrating that we couldn't provide them with a program that worked or a curriculum that worked. So we had to redesign the whole thing. And uh, whoever, uh, whenever we, you redesign, redesign a curriculum, it takes time because that's the way universities work. It takes time to go through the whole bureaucracy and redesigning it. So I thought long about what we're going to change, and that was even more frustrating because I couldn't see any end to it or what would be better. Um, because my point of view was so locked on into specialization, specialization I couldn't see any other way. And then I had a conversation with a former student of mine, who's now R&D head at a big visual effects studio. And he said something to me that uh, I vividly remember. Uh, and he said, have you looked at what your students are doing, which projects they are doing, and is there any correlation between that and what's happening in the industry? And I said, of course, I, oh, maybe not as much as I should have. So we did that. Uh, looked very closely at what was happening in the industry and what was the reaction of our students to, to these trends. So the first thing we looked at was VR, obvious. Most of you probably remember Paul Malaki and John Carmack when they were presenting the first prototypes uh, and then the first DK1 came out and students latched onto it immediately. Uh, and they created a beautiful bachelor's final project called Quanero. 
which was uh, about time mechanics uh, and, and playing around with that in time mechanics. And then we went on to the masters, again, ignoring sort of what was the curriculum and said, okay, we're going to, going to build up, uh, up on, on Conero 1 and create Conero system release. And in hindsight, and I'm going to show you a video they created, it was pretty much all there. Uh, I'm a little bit of shame now to see the video in hindsight and see, wow, I should have really recognized what those guys are doing and that they are way closer to what the future for us is than we were in terms of curriculum. Imagine, you are a detective in the future, and you got access to the best monitoring system ever created. You can reconstruct entire crime scenes in VR, move freely in the scenes, and you even can manipulate the time to get to the bottom of the facts. This is Cunero System Release, a new way to experience stories in VR. We are a team of students at the University of Applied Sciences in Salzburg. In summer 2016, we released Cunero, our first VR project. It was downloaded over 100,000 times and received a lot of very positive feedback. That's why we decided to keep refining the concept and develop Conero 2. Now we are a bigger team with more development time. Therefore, we are able to build several and more complex scenes. We created more than 200 scans of our actors and used their own avatars for motion capturing and facial animation in order to create as believable characters as possible. Our goal is to create a new form of presence in a story, where we not just present you the plot of the narrative, but send you in many different scenes with many different characters to search for plot points by yourself and let you connect them independently to a story. To achieve that, we have developed a new storytelling concept, which is tied to a game mechanic. For instance, you'll be able to mark suspicious events and connect them in a causal network of evidence to prove or disprove presumptions and accusations. During the development process, we will surely encounter many problems and insights and want to share them with you. So if you are interested in our project or in VR, follow us and help us to push this still new medium forward. So the next trend we, uh, we saw was when Unreal 4 launched, um, something happened to our teams. Our teams used to be a, a little bit heavy on the coder side of the team. And that is because uh, out of the necessity of how to balance teams, we were more on the process versus data side of game design or game development. So more higher interactivity, less visual content because if you go more into the data side, you suddenly uh, faced with a situation where there's such a demand for visual art that our teams couldn't cope with that. So we tended to go uh, on the interactive side, which is a great thing. As someone who teaches game design, I, I love the idea that it, the games are about interaction and gameplay more than visuals. But with Unreal 4, we, saw, we suddenly saw that teams were balancing out, and that was great because now three coders and three artists could create something that has both visual fidelity, visual quality, uh, and a, an amount of visual uh, detail that is really nice and great gameplay. And again, I'd like to show you a quick clip of what that looks like in action. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And I wouldn't be much of a professor if I didn't put my students front and center. Uh, Waylon is going to be on Steam shortly. Uh, if anyone wants to wish list it, that would be the QR code, which will be in the presentation. Um, the next trend was somewhat of a homecoming for me, and that was the resurgence of Houdini. Remember I said I started out with side effects and switched from prisms to Houdini as soon as it was released, and resurgence is maybe the wrong word because Houdini's obviously been always been there, but for a market like Austria, if you're not working at, at uh, digital domain or ILM or rhythm and use, Houdini sort of vanished out of the market. Um, and then it came back. Like four or five years ago, it felt like um, sort of everywhere, everything all at once. Uh, Houdini popped up with students all the time. And one of the most fascinating projects was when the students we had, Jakob Vazak and AKA Wintel, uh, who is a great uh, sound dude, created an album and uh, asked two of my animation students to do a video with that. And the two of uh, them created something that I still truly admire uh, and want to show you what Houdini could do within half a year, two people. Thank you. 
So Shameless Plug Part 2, <laughs> that's the album. Uh, called uh, Second Connection. Uh, the track was Emergence. Uh, I think he's a great artist, uh, and it's an awesome album. So what's next? The trend was going on. We were seeing virtual production. Uh, Mandalorian sort of changed the way we thought about uh, the relationship between our animation and our film department. Usually our film department sort of uh, did their job and then at the end gave the stuff, traditional post-production, to animation guys and uh, ladies. Uh, the problem is with universities of applied sciences, there is a final date. You can't study forever. So at the end of May, in your sixth semester, your final project has to be ended. And so if the film crews took a little more time, it became a crunch phase for the animation people. And I'm not even talking about the sound department, who's sometimes even after that. Um, the idea of virtual production sort of turned this on its head. Uh, and suddenly the film crews had to think about pre-production a lot more and be more involved in that. Uh, and that, bal again, balanced out the relationship between those two departments. And it led to something I'll be talking about, uh, about in a minute, uh, to a beautiful partnership with a virtual production studio called Halo Stage in Berlin, Potsdam. The last trend we observed, uh, and that was the game changer for the curriculum, was the release of UE5. Why was it so important to us? Because as an animation department, we had dealt with a problem for over a decade. Uh, and that was we had students who wanted to go into games, and we had students who wanted to go into film. And there was an overlap between those. But it was problematic to a degree, and they all each had its own specialization necessary. And suddenly, UE5 blurs that line to a degree where we sort of could to start to ignore it. And the final straw was when a second semester bachelor student just created an animation uh, and didn't render it, but put it into Unreal Engine 5 and rendered it out. So we decided it's time to go real time with our animation uh, department, at least at the master's level, and we never looked back. So when we looked at what we wanted to keep uh, and take over into the master's degree, we saw the seeds of what we needed within our bachelor program, and that was interactive authoring, rendering, and VFX. Those were the three big issues or the three big topics we wanted to carry over. But that meant we needed to drop our paradigm of granularity in our curriculum. We dropped a lot of those specialized classes and go back to a sort of of our, to back to our roots, to a more generalist approach. Um, and when we think about the generalist versus specialist approach, uh, we heard a lot of successful students. And they were, were all great artists, uh, sort of the Robins uh, of our uh, program. They were successful in their jobs. They had developed their own visual language. They were capable of using the tools they were taught. But when, when we had a closer look, we saw that there was a level above that. And that was our extremely successful uh, alumni. And those had an additional sort of superpower. And that superpower was understanding, a further understanding of the technology they were using. The ability to, to sort of link those technologies, to work around limitations and hurdles, an in-depth understanding of game engines, uh, and the interconnectivity between all those aspects. So they were sort of the Batmans to our Robins. Uh, they were more capable, they were more knowledgeable, and ultimately they were more powerful. So that is where we thought, well, I think we know where we needed to go. So for me personally, a new hope towards a curriculum that's different and that leaves behind old paradigms. So what we came up with after we realized our students cross industry, our generalist versus specialist history, and the career paths of our students, we said, okay, there's one thing in the center of what we want to do, and that is interactive workflows. Interaction would be king in what we're going to do. Uh, it would all revolve around that being as an authoring environment or as a render engine. Then we would partner up with procedural, uh, uh, Ubisoft uh, head of development said to me over dinner Sunday, it's all going to be procedural for us in the future. 
Uh, and we sort of recognized that uh, through Houdini and other tools and other things we saw in the industry. And we, when we saw interactive and procedural combined, it became something very special. So the last part of the puzzle was production workflows. And that was the glue between the other two, to put that into something that is so the real world check towards our classrooms. And therefore, the profile for our new kind of student or what we wanted to educate was the generalist technical artists. And as someone has mentioned who loves role playing, for me personally and between us, I always thought of these uh, girls and boys of the CG technomancers of the future. People who could turn technology into magic. So the last part, what we needed to do was ask us three questions, and that is the what, the who, and the how. The what was easy. What tools do we need to teach them to become those technomancers? Who's going to teach those tools? And finally, how are we going to teach them? So first step was find the most versatile, versatile powerful tools on the market, tools that students let students become generalists in the best possible way uh, to support our vision of them becoming next generation artists and a tool set that represents the best of today with the potential of what's to come. And as a surprise to no one, um, we chose Unreal Engine as our home base. There was really no alternative because when we looked at it, it opened our students to so many areas of expertise. Obviously, film and games, but uh, visualization, simulation, VR, automotive. Look at the tracks here at Unreal Fest, and you'll see what kinds of potentials and what kinds of uh, settings Unreal can support. And it solved, as I mentioned, our problems with, on one hand, the games versus film students, blurring the line between those, and then uh, solving our problem of rendering. And we know it's a little early, probably. We know that there's still a place for offline rendering in the world out there. We, we have lots of people who work, or uh, alumni who work in the visual effects industry, and there will be offline rendering for a while to come there. But when we look at the bigger picture, we saw, OK, the visual effects industry is growing. Streaming services like Netflix has, have grown the market in Europe very much, but if you look at the bigger picture, we saw the, the interactive side of things was growing even, even faster and broader. So we decided, okay, let's head all in. We're going to leave offline rendering behind and make it all uh, real-time rendering. And with Unreal came in another major benefit. Oh, sorry, I forgot something. Within the first year of implementing Unreal, we saw immediate success with our students. And what I'm going to show you is a brief clip of student works after half a year of Unreal Education.
And what it did also did was the decision to go with Unreal opened up the Unreal ecosystem to us. And I have to give a shout out to my colleague Radomir Dinic, who is uh, not only a great programmer, but a visionary when it comes to tech and speaks Serbian. And that was helpful because um, some of you might know that three lateral, the meta human guys, are from Serbia. So one day he just said to me, why don't we shoot an email to three lateral and ask if we can work together? And he did. And that was the start of something that was truly special to us. Uh, it laid the groundwork for uh, having a conversation with uh, Capturing Reality, which have been an awesome partner uh, for us. Thomas be having invited me here, teaching in Salzburg, and uh, have a lot of talking to Luis from Quixel, uh, and having that connection to MetaHumans, to Quixel, to uh, Capturing Reality, opened up so many possibilities for our students and connections, and it fulfilled a dream of mine I'm going to come to a little later on. So integ integrating Unreal was a huge step. And now we wanted to have, if Unreal was our V8 engine, we wanted to have a supercharger for that engine. And that was Houdini. So combining the two, two things was, came in a way natural to us. Remember, I was a Houdini artist 20 years ago. Uh, and it felt like coming home to combining something I really loved and something I truly admire. And again, immediately we saw the results in our students. Students within one semester were building their tools in Houdini and used them in Unreal. They, for a game they're creating right now, they built this Garland tool, a random edge bevel tool, paper stack tools. Uh, it went like that. And for me, it was somewhat of a validation of our idea uh, which made me extremely happy to see it put into real-world use. So the next question was the who. Who's going to teach it? And I have to uh, go back a little bit in my life, because when I was a very young artist, I visited my first SIGGRAPH in Los Angeles, I think when I was 20, 21 years old. Uh, uh, I think it was 1999 or 2000. And I listened to a presentation by a visual effects supervisor who worked on episode one Star Wars. And I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Uh, so that was special on its own. But afterwards, um, I, I went up to him and I started talking to him. And to my surprise, he was not only very nice and totally cool, he talked to me for half an hour, which to this day is very special to me. And it, it warms my heart to this day that someone who's that big in the industry takes the time to talk to a young guy from Austria who has no real business with him, just wanted to have a conversation. And that feeling I wanted to give to my students. So the who was the big question was, we want to have industry professionals who work on great projects in their day-to-day -day lives. And we were very lucky that we uh, developed a relationship to RiseFX, a big visual effects company in Germany who have several uh, locations all over the place, Berlin, Stuttgart, Munich, and we have two lecturers from there, Andreas Giesen and Jonas Sorgenfrei, who are both very passionate, extremely nice to the student, and, and put all their energy into educating our student. And the other experience I had was when uh, I worked at my first company, I told you we were uh, resellers for Houdini. So I became sort of a German-speaking demo artist for side effects. And I was at a conference in Stuttgart very young, and there was this guy from side effects themselves called Jeff Wagner. And uh, I was demoing Houdini, and lots of customers said, like, oh, yeah, that's nice, but compared to Jeff Wagner, you suck. Uh, and that was a sentence that wasn't only uttered to me. Lots of demo artists heard the sentence, compared to Jeff Wagner, you suck. Um, and if you saw Jeff Wagner work, it was speaking of magic. I've never seen anyone work with Houdini like he did. So that was exactly what I wanted, again, for my students, people who use their, who built the tools, who work at the companies who create the tools, to teach them how to use them. And that is where Reality Capture comes in. And Reality Capture and Thomas and Victor came to Salzburg and taught our students how to do photogram photo uh, photogram photogrammetry. And I'm going to give you a brief video, a uh, quick look about how that looked like.
Yeah, big applause for the guys from Reality Capture and Quixel sitting here. Thanks again, Thomas, Victor, for being such pleasurable teachers and uh, mentors to our students. Thank you very much. Um, so the final piece of the puzzle was the how. How are we going to do it in terms of classroom? And it was, again, pretty simple. Interdis interdisciplinary teams and interdisciplinary projects. Um, we, had, we have a lot of different departments, audio, film, media design, game development, web and communities, VR, and we want them all to work together to sort of simulate a real-world situation, a real-world game development studio, a real-world film production, and so on. And one of the best applications of that was our partnership with Halo Stage. Uh, we had the luck that our, one of our former audio students, our students worked there and offered us sort of to bring us together. And Halo Stage was very nice because they said, we're going to give you one week of shooting time at our virtual production studio, which is awesome. Uh, and we are extremely thankful for that uh, because it allows us to use a technology that would, com would be completely out of range for a university like, uh, like ours. So um, I'm really, really happy and really thankful to have that as a best case scenario for our interdisciplinary project with our interdisciplinary teams. And this is the last video I'm going to show you for today, a quick uh, overview of how that project is going. And Halo Stage was not only providing us with the opportunity to do one week shoot, but they also provided us with two great guys who were stage operators there, uh, Adrian Weber and Lauritz Reich, who are teaching our students how to use that, uh, hey, that uh, virtual production set. And again, we had the chance to have people teach who are really working in the industry. The last part, which is sort of a given, is we're using motion capture and performance to bring the whole thing together. So that is how our master's looks, how our master program looks now. Interactive workflows, procedural workflows, and production workflows, and they go through all four semesters of the master's education. With no more granularity, have big blocks, and have the technology to support those. Um, I think there's lots of great stuff to come. Everyone in this room probably is aware of what's going on in terms of mid-journey, and DALI and uh, text to image synthesis and text to video, text to 3D. There is a lot coming. And it's coming at a speed that is becoming faster and faster and faster. And that will mean that we have to change our education on a, in, a, on, in a more rapid way, in a more responsive way. Um, but I feel at ease somewhat because uh, in having developed the new masters, we, I think we have a better grasp of where to look basically, and what we want from our education and how to adapt uh, more quickly. So I can't wait to see all of it. I can't wait to see what the next generation of tools is bringing. I can't wait to see what uh, the industry is going to do now. But most of all, I can't wait to see what the students that go through that education are capable of when they go out into the industry and create magic. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions, if there are any. <laughs>